Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you so much for this opportunity to gather to, together to fellowship in your house. And we pray your blessings upon us and upon your word. We ask you to use it to your purpose in each of our lives. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Um, I'd like to begin this morning with the phrase, this world is not my home, and we'd best get used to the idea. Uh, this is the basis for Peter's arguments for submission as believers, as pilgrims and sojourners to the governing authority in this world, the submission of servants to masters or workers to bosses, and the submission of wives to husbands. And Peter continues, beginning here in chapter 3, verse 13, with these words. Who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. Do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you, not if, when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Peter begins in verse 13 what some consider to be a rhetorical question. Who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? Now consider that in light of what he said before about the suffering of believers. Others see this as Peter's way of challenging us that the logical benefit of doing the right thing would be to receive the right treatment. In either case, he asks, who is he who will harm you? And this is a significant part of this particular passage because that's the thought that dwells in the back of our mind. Who is going to harm us? What is going to be the source of our suffering, if any? Now, Peter says, who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? Now, he's using the word mimites for followers. And that's where we get our English word mimic. It's the same word used by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, where he said, Be followers of me, even as I am a follower of Christ. Or, more literally, imitate me, as I also imitate Christ. Ultimately, we're supposed to be imitators, followers of Christ, whether we're treated kindly or unkindly by the world, for he is our Lord. But Peter's reminder in the very next verse is that what should be is no guarantee of how we will be treated in this heathen world. Be prepared for suffering. That isn't the way that it ought to be, but that is the way that it's going to be. He's already uh, made an effort to encourage us to live for Christ and his glory. This is our central premise when we're treated badly for doing good. And whether or not we see this as a rhetorical question, in a sense, is irrelevant because in 1 Peter 3, 14 through 16, he is offering us an exhortation that is based on the suffering that he's already spoken about. Now, I'm beginning in 1 Peter 3, 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. Now, that doesn't seem to be consistent, does it? If you suffer, you're blessed. That's not the way we think. And then he says, And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a reason, a defense for everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who defile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Now this portion is exhortation. Suffering for righteousness' sake is a common theme in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed. It's the word makarios. Normally, in a worldly sense, it means enjoying favorable circumstances, having things go well. This is the way we want the world to be. But in this particular case, it has an alternate meaning, blessed being a state of being marked by fullness from God. When we think of being blessed in the world, it has to do with fame, it has to do with fortune, but if we're thinking in terms of being blessed by God, that may or may not have anything to do with the world. Now be careful, because when we get this wrong, we end up in the name it and claim it part of quote-unquote Christianity today. The blessings. You know you're blessed because you have everything you could possibly need. Well, that's not what James is talking about. It's not what Peter is talking us. Peter is challenging us to judge our lives by God's promises rather than by our circumstances in this present world. This is, as we've seen so often in Scripture, a matter of walking by faith and not by sight. It's in this context that Peter argues that we're to challenge the world rather than to cower in fear. First of all, Peter admonishes us, do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. I'd like to look at that a little more literally, if you will. Do not fear their fears. That's what you'll find in the Greek text. Now, threats, fears, the word afraid, are all based on the Greek word phobos. That's where we get our word phobia. My wife has a phobia for height. She has a phobia for tight places. She has a phobia for moving waters. She is phobic, fearful. Their fears is used because this is a genitive clause. And what it really means is, don't fear the things that are feared in the world, the things in the world that inspire fear. Those ought not to be concerned. Jesus said, do not fear those who may kill the body, but rather fear him who can destroy the body and soul in hell. This is only short term. Eternity is coming. We don't have to fear the world. We don't have to fear anything in this world. This is a short time frame. And I'm reminded of the words of Paul in Romans chapter 8, 38 and 39. Paul wrote, I am persuaded that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do not be afraid of the things that makes the world fear. You remember in the Gospels, Jesus said, do not worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what kind of shelter you're going to have. God provides for the birds of the air. He provides for the animals of the land. And he provides for you. Trust God. He is your source. Secondly, Peter admonishes us, do not be troubled. Now, this is the Greek word terasso. And it means to stir up, to agitate, as if you would stir the waters. Now, I haven't taken a bath in I can't tell you how many decades. Don't worry, I'm taking showers. But I don't take baths. It's been a long time, but I remember uh, David, when he was staying with us, always would take a bath. He would fill the water as high as he could, as hot as he could, and then he'd, he'd stir it up a little bit, and he'd put Epsom salts in there. And he'd stir it up again and get that water moving. That's what this word means. Don't be troubled. Don't be agitated. Don't be all stirred up. Fear is an emotion. Troubled is a mental state. Both of these have to do with the soul, the suke. Uh, this is the immaterial part of man. We are body, soul, and spirit. Uh, body, the physical part. Soul, intellect, emotions, will, 
we might say the heart and the mind, the soul is our God consciousness. It's the mind that is troubled. It is the mind that becomes afraid. And so we have to have a means of putting this out of our heart and out of our lives. And so listen to what Peter says in chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. Remember, he said, don't be afraid of the things that make them afraid, and don't be troubled, don't be agitated. Instead, verse 15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you, when they speak evil of you and call you evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Peter's answer to being afraid and being troubled is to sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Now, this is the word hagiazo, and it means to make holy, to set apart, to consecrate. It's primarily a religious term. It was used frequently in the Old Testament for the tabernacle and the temple and for the various things that were in the temple and the tabernacle, within the Holy of Holies. And uh, the Ark of the Covenant was sanctified. It was set apart. The candelabra was sanctified. It was set apart. These things were made holy unto the Lord. And that was one of its primary, more tangible uses. But in this particular case, God is using this to challenge us to make God holy, set him apart to that holiest place in our hearts, in our lives. As one person put it, place God on the throne of your heart. In practical terms, sanctifying the Lord God means making him first in our lives. And if God is first, then everything else and everyone else is at least second. Fears, they have no place because God is sanctified in our heart. Troubles, they have no place if we have sanctified God in our hearts. I said it's primarily a religious term, but in this particular case, to really sanctify God in our hearts, we need to know him. We need to understand who God is. We need to understand what God's will is for our lives. And that's where we come back to what you know, at least if you've been around me any time, one of my primary premises. We have to spend time in the Word of God. The Bible tells us who God is. The world has a thousand gods. That's probably too low of a number, millions of of gods. We need to know who God really is. The Bible will tell us. We need to know what God's will is. The world will tell you all manner of things, but the Bible will tell us what is in fact God's will. And if we are to set him apart in our lives, we need to know who he is. We need to know what his will is for our lives as believers, as followers, to use Paul's words as mimics of Christ. And as we make him first in our hearts, then these other things will be forced in time out of our minds and hearts. And so when we set God apart, sanctify him on the throne of our hearts, Peter admonishes then to always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Make no mistake, if you set God apart in your heart, your behavior is going to differ from those around you in the world. Your behavior is going to seem odd to them, unusual to them unique to them. In fact, strange to them. Because how the world lives and how we are to live are two totally different things. And so we are to be ready, always prepared to give a defense to everyone who asks us 
about the hope that we have. That may, in fact, be when we share the gospel because that's our hope. And they're going to say, that's not what I'm hoping for. And we need to be ready to defend our hope. I think so often of individuals who are standing by the bedside, a loved one is passing away. I've walked into many a room like that over the years. I can't begin to tell you how many. And I've walked in and there, are the, there is this believing family and they are trusting God. Are they sad? Absolutely. They know they're going to be separated. They do not necessarily want that person to leave their lives, but they know that that person is going to be with the Lord, and they know that someday they're going to be with the Lord. And I trust you, the grief that that family has there next to that deathbed is a very different thing from the grief that you will find around the deathbed of individuals who are not believers. And this is where the weeping and the wailing and the uncertainty and the anger is found because there is no hope for them. They have no hope. The person who's dying has no hope. This is death. It's that terrible last enemy. And he has just won the victory. Two different worlds. And we need to be ready if we happen to be standing by that bedside to give a defense for why we have hope. Now, defense is the Greek word apologia. We get our English word apologetics from it. But we also get the word apology. But I want you to understand, this is not an apology as we use it. You bump into someone going through the doorway into the store. Oh, I'm sorry. That's an apology. But it's not a defense. It's not an explanation. Paul is, or rather, Peter's talking about an apologetic, and that word means to speak on behalf of oneself or of others against accusations approved to be false. It's to defend oneself, to defend our actions, to defend our faith. If you'd like some examples, I'll give you three. First of all, Peter's first sermon after Pentecost is an example of an apologetic. Another example is Paul's defense before the mob in Jerusalem, and that's found in Acts chapter 22. And then again, Paul's defense, his apologetic to the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 3. They accused him, and yet he gave his defense, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. My faith is in him. He is the Christ. He is the promised one. And he gave them not an apology for being a Christian, but a defense for being a Christian. He defended his preaching. He defended his life. And Peter admonished us to do that with a spirit of meekness and fear. Now these words are respectively prautes and phobos. Phobos, which is fear, is one that we already know about. Prautes is different. Prautes is a gentleness of attitude and behavior. Now if you think about an argument, and then you think about a discussion. I think they give you the contrast. When you have an argument, your voices get louder and they get harsher. And the longer that argument goes, the louder the voices become and the more angry and the words begin to change. But a defense, a discussion, is something that is done quietly and reasonably, because you're not my enemy, and I'm not arguing with you. I'm simply answering your question. I'm defending my faith. And there's no reason for us to be angry. They are not our enemies. They are lost souls, and we defend our faith to them with hopes of winning them to Christ. It is done with respect. It's done with honor. Moreover, Peter tells us here in verse 15, our defense is to be given having a good conscience. And notice these words, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your what? Good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. You see, this is not about suffering for doing evil, but suffering for 
for doing good. When we make our defense, it is something that's being done with a good conscience. I'm not trying to get out of paying for something that I did wrong. I'm trying to explain something that I did right. Now, conscience is, by definition, a knowing of oneself. It enables us to bear inner witness to our own conduct. It's a moral challenge. It's a discerning of right from wrong. And this is what Peter's talking about when he says, having a good conscience. Perhaps you would use the phrase, having a clear conscience. You look into the mirror, in a sense. You know what you've said. You know what you have done. Your conscience will either clear you or condemn you. Have you ever tried to, to argue with your wife or husband about something, insisting that you didn't do any throng, anything wrong when you knew you did it? I know when our children were young, Sarah was quite frequently alibying, not defending, alibying. She had the most creative explanations for how she broke the bedroom window or why her hand was in the cookie gar jar when she was told she couldn't have any more. This was Sarah's fallback deception. And my wife would look into her eyes, and the moment my wife looked in her eyes, she knew if Sarah was telling the truth or if she was telling a lie, because Sarah's conscience was advertised through her eyes. Now, you may be an accomplished liar, you may get away with it with your wife or your husband or your parent or your child, but I promise you'll, you'll never get away with it with yourself, and you'll never get away with it with God. We are to make our defense having a clear conscience that we have done nothing wrong. Conscience, or a clear conscience, is that evaluation that frees us from guilt. But for one to defend his faith in Christ, his life must be consistent with his profession. And for the life to be consistent, Christ must rule on the throne of our lives. So Peter says, when we're reviled, not for our sins, but our good conduct, we have a clear conscience. Our conscience and conduct must be consistent. And it's here I'd like to begin to compare the beginning and ending verse of this particular portion. And remember, we've been looking at verses 14 through 17, and I just want to look at verse 14 and verse 17. In verse 14, Peter said, Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. In verse 17, It is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good rather than for doing evil. Yes, we may well suffer. We probably will suffer for doing good, for living for Christ, for turning away from the ways of the world. We will suffer for that. But we should simply be ready to give a strong defense for our reason. Our reason is Christ is our Lord, He is our Savior, and we are following Him. Now, from a human perspective, let's be perfectly honest. None of us would care to suffer whether we've done something good or something evil. I don't want to be punished whether I've been right or whether I've been wrong. That's human nature. From the, from the Garden of Eden, we've been making excuses for why we did what we know we shouldn't have done. More to the point, as Christians, we should not suffer for doing good. But that's not this world. That's a perfect world, and that perfect world has yet to come. When sin entered into this world, by man's hand, suffering and death entered with it. Nevertheless, we must remember, everything passes through God's hands, and he has promised us 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, no test, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape 
that you may be able to bear it, or more appropriately, bear up under it, no matter how great the weight God has provided a way. The problem is not that God has not provided a way. It's that we are not willing to bear the weight. We want the easy life, and that's reality. And so Peter admonished us, it's better, it's better if, the will, if it's the will of God to duff, suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Yes, it's appropriate to suffer for doing evil. It's not appropriate to suffer for doing good. But in point of fact, we will, as believers. Now, this was his exhortation. As we pick up in verse 18, we're now looking at an exaltation. And that's the remainder of this chapter, verses 18 through 22. It's an exaltation of Christ who suffered for our sins with a view to what he has accomplished. What we are called to accomplish is based on what he has accomplished. Follow along, 1 Peter 3.18. Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype, which now delivers us, baptism. Now, note this, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. This is the exaltation of Christ in his suffering, particularly his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. He suffered once for sins on Calvary. Do you believe that? Do you understand that? When he died on the cross, he died for every sin of every person who ever had lived or whoever would live once. We do not bring sacrifices week after week and month after month and year after year. The sacrifice has been made, and that sacrifice is Christ Jesus. He is the righteous one who is sacrificed for the unrighteous ones, and that's us. And this is a declaration of victory. He was crucified, but he lives again. Death could not hold him. And that proves the expiation of our sins was completed in him and by him to bring us to God. We are free from sin because when Christ died, he took our sins on us. He is exalted for having done that. And if it's the will of God that we should suffer for doing good, we're blessed in that it's God's will that we should be one with Christ who has also suffered for us in death and in life. Paul proclaims this promise to those who believe in Romans 6, 5 through 7. Paul writes, if we have been united together in the likeness of Christ's death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, our old man was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be done away with, in order that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. I died with Christ. I am free from sin. This is the victory. Moreover, he's accomplished that victory for every believer of every age. He died once for all. And in verse 19, Peter proclaims something that not only does the world reject, but sadly, many believers reject as well. That Christ descended to Sheol to proclaim his victory to those who awaited his coming. I'm looking at Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. 
Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. You remember back in Peter, he said to us that we have been united with him. When he descend, ascended on high, he led captivity captive. He gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Even those who argue that Christ's body was stolen from the tomb will completely reject the idea that he descended into Sheol to preach to the lost and the saved. And Peter offers an example here of Noah and his family, something that that generation could look forward to. The ark is a preview, if you will, of Christ. It's the antitype of salvation in him. And you think about Noah and his family. 120 years Noah preached to people who rejected him and ridiculed him. And in fact, he suffered for that preaching. They laughed at him. They mocked him. But Noah and his family went into the ark, and the others did not. Noah and his family represent the believers who died in faith. And they were waiting for, the, for Christ to go to the cross and pay their debt. And he not only paid the debt on, debt on Calvary, but he descended to Sheol itself to preach to them that their salvation had been secured and their sins had been forgiven. And they, was, they then went with him. He says he led captivity captive and he brought them out of Sheol on the heaven. This is our hope. He preached to both because he died for both. Noah was in the ark. That was the example. Salvation is only to those who are in Christ. He uses the example of baptism, and I love what he says because it's so important. We have so many people that have so many different ideas about baptism. 1 Peter 3.21, There is also an antitype which also saves us, Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I spoke with an individual probably two years ago about the gospel and asked him if he had received Christ. He said, well, I've been baptized. I said, you've been baptized. I said, what, what happened? He said, I went down a sinner and I came up a wet sinner because he hadn't put his faith in Christ. All you get without Christ is wet. With Christ, you get saved. And I want to emphasize the fact that Peter clearly states he's not talking about water baptism. He's talking about how we are being placed into Christ when we put our faith in Christ. It's not the cleansing of the flesh. It's the cleansing of the Spirit. And that is is what gives us the answer of a good conscience. And finally, Peter speaks of Christ's ultimate exaltation in verse 22. He has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, gave himself on the cross to purchase our salvation. And God has placed him at his right hand, at that position of power and authority that God has reserved for him as a, a representation that he and his sacrifice have been completely acceptable to God. And this is where Peter concludes his argument. We're to submit ourselves to God for his glory, even suffering for doing good, because Christ, God the Father, has subjected all things to Christ. And because we are in Christ, all things are ours in Christ. What this world has for the few years we're here is nothing compared to what God has for us 
in eternity. I go back again to Paul. I'm persuaded neither death nor life, angels nor principalities nor powers, things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, or any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No suffering. No fear. We are in Christ. God has promised us eternity with him because we are cleansed. I ask you to bow with me for a moment of prayer as we prepare for our communion service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your word. And Father, as Peter has exhorted us and exalted Christ, we pray that you would help us to take these words to mind. And we pray, Father, that we would truly sanctify you in our hearts and banish all fear and troubling of mind. In Jesus' name, amen.